Hi everyone, welcome. We're gonna get started. Um, my name is Maeve and I'm a visitor services student here at the museum. And before we begin tonight's program, we should take a moment to acknowledge on which the land on which UC Davis sits. For thousands of years, this land has been home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, Kachaldehi Band of Wintun Indians of the Calusa Indian Community, Kletzaldehi Wintun Nation, and Yochadehi Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Raquel. I'm a graduate student here at the University of California, Davis. To start, I want to express my gratitude to Jan Shrim and Maria Minetti Shrim for their visionary support of the arts at UC Davis. I would also like to thank the Minetti Shrim Museum for hosting tonight's lecture. Finally, I would also like to thank the art department faculty for their dedication and expertise in curating and organizing this program. Tonight's speaker comes to UC Davis as a visiting artist in the California studio Manetti Shrim Artist Residency. The Manetti Shrim California Studio is a visiting artist program in the Department of Art and Art History. Visiting artists engage with students at the undergraduate and graduate levels through seminars, critiques, and public lectures in residencies that are focused on teaching. Tonight, we are excited to present Josiah McElhinney. Josiah McElhinney is an expert glass blower whose installations, sculptures, paintings, and films engage with the history of his medium and the history of ideas with particular interest in the fields of literature, architecture, music theory, and astronomy. His works often combine glass or mirror with other materials to emphasize the importance of the act of looking as a subject in and of itself. He has received numerous awards, including the MacArthur Fellowship, the 15th Rocco Commission at the Corning Museum of Glass and the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award. McElhinney has exhibited widely, including selections, excuse me, excluding, including selected solo exhibitions at the Cantor Art at Center at Stanford University, Moody Center for the Arts at Rice University, Houston, and Madison Square Park, New York. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Josiah McElhinney. Um, well, good evening, and um, I guess uh, I wanted to just take a moment to express my gratitude uh, in being invited to this uh, great university and to be so incredibly generously welcomed by so many from the faculty to the students um, and uh, also the opportunity for me to learn as I come to this institution of learning and I've been lucky to work with the uh, music uh, the math department and uh, uh, the astronomy department. Um, and I definitely have learned an immense amount. Um, I think the students in the um, art department are really um, fortunate to have the support of somebody like Maria, who uh, makes this all possible. And I think it's a really uh, wonderful um, group of uh, students here now. And I'm, I'm sure that's often the case. Um, I guess I'd like to start out by saying something um, that <laughs> might um, uh, make a couple of people in the audience cringe, but uh, but it's, it's for a good cause. Um, the two or three people told me that in this series of lectures that there was a, a lecture uh, by an artist I, I know very li a little bit, but I'm also a, a huge fan of. And they said the same thing, that basically her lecture was the best lecture on anything that they had ever heard in their whole lives. <laughs> Hearing that and following Helen Molesworth's uh, magnificent and inspiring and challenging lecture last week, um, uh, I feel um, uh, prompted to say I, I will not live up to that. 
But to be honest, thinking about that made me wonder, well, uh, if I try to not live up to that, what way could that be interesting? And so that changed my approach to my organiz organizing my talk. Um, uh, and I want to preface this a little bit with saying that, so I've been uh, speaking about my work now for about 30 years. And, um, and in the beginning, I really spoke in a way where I think that off artists often feel um, a need to, which is essentially to explain who they are why and why they should be an artist and and kind of justify what they do in a kind of framework. Um, and I did that for many years. Um, I would tell my story, if you will, of how I became an artist and what it meant to me and what I was trying to do. And then I realized uh, at one point that I'm given this incredible opportunity of speaking and privilege and responsibility maybe of speaking in public to a group of people who are kindly sitting, attentively listening, and maybe preparing questions. So I thought, well, why am I doing why am I talking about myself? And so what's what's the why do that? So I thought, okay, I will come to um, the lecture prepared with a set of subjects by which I will illustrate through my own work of things that I think are really important basically things that I believe in, that I care about, that I hope for, um, and that basically use the opportunity to um, think about those ideas in public um, and add them, add them to, the, to, the, to, to the pot, if you, as you, if you will. But I, as I explained to some people earlier today, the same thing has happened at virtually every lecture I did that. Um, I got always interesting questions, but they always also got the same single question over and over again. And then you know, somebody would inevitably stand up and say, okay, Josiah, yeah, you talk about all these big ideas, all these, uh, let's say, political hopes and dreams and um, fears, but is that really in your work? Um, and, and I never have a good answer because I don't know. And basically, I think that um, some artists, basically the ideas that drive them, the ideas that motivate what they do, are, are like one-to-one -one visible in what they do. You know, um, maybe they take an action that is so clearly evocative of the values they hold that it's, it's unavoidable to see. I don't think that's the case with me. And so thinking about that and thinking about essentially being vulnerable instead of um, um, uh, being perfect at at giving a lecture that does all the things it's supposed to do. I thought today I would start by organizing my lecture around a question and basically uh, a question that's involved with the, the response that I've gotten from the audience, uh, from various audiences many times. So is, are these ideas in my work? And are these idea, are ideas in artwork or how are ideas in artwork? Or what, more importantly, what my question is, what is knowledge? What do you do with it? And where does it go? And that question seems to me like, um, I don't know if it's particularly well formulated. I just been kicking around in my head the past few days. And, um, but it does seem like an appropriate question to ask at a university um, and a university that has a broad uh, set of uh, um, fields of study, a broad set of field, broad field, a set of broad, a broad set of fields of study and, um, and that includes art. Uh, because art uh, and the relationship of knowledge to art is, I think, uh, a lifelong or uh, permanent perennial question. So I'm going to start each little group. I normally never, ever do this. I never show source material like as a kind of way of explaining or talking about the work. But I'm going to do that today because I wanted to kind of ex think through in public with you, if you will, um, this question of knowledge. So um, mostly I'm showing the most recent things I've done. I've worked in uh, around many different subjects, if you will, um, too many subjects maybe. Um, but um, so I can't talk about all the, the, the fairly diverse projects I've done. Um, but so I'm sticking mostly to uh, just what's been happening in the past uh, year or two and then um but one older i'm going to end with one older project that seemed important to talk about as well 
So this drawing, um, I wish, I hope that there's somebody in the audience who knows how to pronounce his name, but is uh, uh, Marcel Chevreur. Uh, he's a French chemist, and he made this drawing in 1864. And he was the inventor of color matching. So, you know, okay, we want to print a textile in red in um red on a textile or red on a piece of paper in London and we want to print it in New Delhi and we want it to be the same color. Well, first you have to know what red it is. So, um, and he's also, uh, as a side note, he's the, a, did a kind of set of medical studies in a way that um, taught us a lot about how the eye sees, um, which a uh, concept called simultaneous contrast, which um, I won't go into, but but um, this drawing struck me and I just kind of could, i just obsessed with this drawing. This, I'm going to just try to explain the drawing. It's, it's a picture of the colors in the rainbow, the colors in this, in sunlight. And basically um, just as a basic, you know, establishing set of facts, um, Newton is famous for writing the, a book in the late 18th century called Optics, which is still, I think, an extremely valuable and important book within science today. V very complicated book. And um, and some people maybe say it's as important as his contributions to the um, idea of gravity. Um, and in that book, he discusses his experiment, which was to darken a room, put a small hole in, um, in the wall, have sunlight pass through a, um, uh, a pass by a mirror and then through a prism and then project up on on the wall. There's a beautiful. If you ever want to look at a, there's a beautiful sketch he made of it, um, easily uh, accessible on the internet. And then he sees the let's say six, seven, or eight colors that are in the visible light spectrum. And so he s says that the visible light is made up of color and that. Brought, color brought together forms light. Unfortunately, at some level, um, basically this uh, usually is termed white light. And basically, uh, while, uh, and I think this is a kind of um, cultural thing, it's got nothing to do with the science. Um, the, the color of the sun is not white, it's yellow. And even if you're on the moon, it's still yellow. So it's a, I, I at one point thought it might be caused by by uh, you know light coming through the the atmosphere, but it's just as yellow apparently on the moon as it is here. So why do we call it white light? Well, white is uh, obviously has so many connotations: racial, ones of purity, religion, many many things. Light is very important, but it seems very peculiar that we call it white to me. As well, basically in Newton's theory of optics or theory of how the world works. There are no browns, grays, or blacks, um, that those are simply qualities of mixture of other colors and are not in of themselves color. Goethe, our, the artist friend, uh, in, 50 years later, comes up with a competing theory and a competing experiment where he, um, he darkens a room and he cuts this kind of slit, a little... Um, instead of a round hole slit, and basically does the same experiment and claims to find something totally different. And basically what he says is that basically first comes darkness, and then out of darkness emerges color, and first it's blue and yellow, and then um, uh, red and green. Um, and basically he's, it came from an observation that he saw on the edges of things through a prism, that it would get dark, and then right at the edge is where you'd see the color. Um, I don't know enough about optics to ex fully explain why, what what that phenomenon is. It's a real phenomenon, but it it doesn't really mean that color comes from darkness, um, although that's a very evocative idea. And artists really liked his uh, theory, though, because it made it possible to talk about um, color in its relationship to shadow in its relationship to black, browns, and grays. So essentially it was a huge, wonderful expansion of a kind of laying out of how color worked. So there's these been these two competing theories. One is the artistic theory, uh, which is kind of uh, echoes our perception of the world because obviously the world is full of browns, blacks, and grays. Um, but it, um, 
I'm sorry to leave this slide up for so long, but uh, it's uh, I'm getting somewhere, I hope. Um, and uh, they, but it's considered like scientifically incorrect, right? It's not, it's not how actually light functions. Um, uh, and that Newton was the one who was correct. So this, this drawing though is really odd because basically normally when you, when you refract color through a, um, a, a prism or even when you see a rainbow, basically the bands of color are fairly even. They're not perfectly even, but they're fairly even. So basically, and, you, and in this one, you can see it's not even at all. Like most of the color is over on the left. And then there's this long, long expanse of, of, uh, of blues, purples, deep, dark blue and blue, what I call blue black. Um, and on the, and then on the other side, it goes from red all the way down to what I'm calling a red black. So, and then it's what, and then because it's disproportionately stretched, I have the, I have a theory that he tipped the prism or you tip tipped the mirror that to basically distort what he saw. And basically within the idea was to stretch out the spectrum so he could identify more colors. He wanted to know what colors are in light. And so basically he makes 32 divisions. He says he can only identify 16 colors, but it seems to me to there's 32. Um, and to my great surprise, he not only places it on a black piece of paper, but at the edges of it, it it's really very close to black. And it's not a pure black. And what is a pure black? There's no such thing really. The same as there's no such thing as pure white. Um, but there's this thing that's effectively black, which is red, black, and blue, black. So I got this idea that as an artist, I could take this observation that essentially the infinite expandability of the color, infinite distortability of color, and the idea that it would go to, it would end on two sides of with the actual light as black. Um, and this is a crazy thing to say, um, but uh, I think it's really important to think, to say things that are crazy because they can help to shift thinking potentially. Speaking to a bunch of physicists this fall, I talked to them and, and in the end, to my great surprise, they said, you're not 100% wrong. So basically, um, and you're not 100% right, but you're not 100% wrong. And they said that basically when, the way the eyes work is that at the two ends of the spectrum, that as you get closer to 390 nanometers or 700 nanometers, is that, which are the two edges, um, that fewer and fewer photons hit the eye. Like basically, so like in the middle of the spectrum, many, 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 many photons hit the eye. But at the, at the ends of it, it's where the, the sensitivity of the cones does not exactly match that at the center, i.e. it gets darker. So basically, yes, at the edge of the light spectrum, you have a kind of a fade to a darker color and I think it's reasonable to call it red, black, and blue, black. So I wanted to try to take this proposal and see how far I can go with it and put it out there in the world in some way. Um, and again, so here's knowledge. I'm, what, what kind of knowledge is it? How, and I've told you this long story. Now I'm going to look at an artwork that basically is simply its own self. It's like there's no explanation with it, but it's based on this idea. So it's a painting. Um, this one's called Cassiopeia. And it's supposed to be actually a little bit funny because it has a cord on it and a switch. And so it's somewhere between a lamp and a painting. And inside of it is a um, set of five gongs that are, are outfitted with a um, um, set of um, essentially magnets that vibrate the gongs and transmit sound. And then the gongs themselves are kind of um, pressed against the wood, and then the sound enters the wood, and so the whole painting becomes a kind of um, sounding board or kind of vibrating surface. And then on on, on the rest of the surface, um, there is uh, this color spectrum, uh, this stretched out color spectrum, um, expanded, you know, up and down in a, a set of colors, showing the kind of um, uh, a new, a different kind of color spectrum than one might normally see and celebrating what uh, Chevreux did. So collaborating with a musician, 
one of the things that I was been fascinated by is some musicians claim of freedom um, by expanding the sound spectrum. So typically the rules are, you know, there's, you know, the, the 88 keys on the piano, but there's a lot in between each note. And by in, by reclaiming that, um, that actually that was a kind of political freedom. And I was really amazed. I wouldn't dare to say that this expansion of the color thing is a, an expression of political freedom, but the people, the musicians who have claimed that in terms of, on behalf of sound, I believe them hundred percent. And I'm moved by it and challenged by it. So I collaborated with a composer and together we talked and talked and talked and he came up with a set of compositions in which he looks for the freedom within the sound spectrum um, based on each of these paintings. And so half the time or more than half the time they're silent and just you're walking along and suddenly it just starts singing. So this is uh, um, what it sounds like a little bit. So um, I will, well, it's not quite done yet. But. That's sorry about the advertisement that was uh, made by my gallery for the show it was in. Um, so this is the back of the painting, which I thought was uh, worth photographing because it's so crazy. This is a very complicated project to make um, just for music people. Uh, it's inspired specifically by a competitor to the theremin, a microtonal instrument called the Andes Martino, which also used a gong that vibrated to uh, create sound. That's how I um, got the idea. Um, then there was another project, uh, which was um, this, which was called uh, Revolving Spectral Harmony. And this was taking a different approach of, of a painted sculpture that that it, that uh, describes this blue, black, and red, black, and then but has motion and based on a Leslie, which is a kind of often associated with soul jazz. It was a, a special instrument for playing the organ, and this this is what David um, created with that. Um, so, um, that piece, um, what, oh, okay, I see. Um, that piece, uh, uh, the sound comes from the circle in the center. It's a vibrating kind of speaker, if you will, and then through the two horns that are, um, spinning, uh. And that piece was inspired by a, a work by Bach um, in a kind of expanded way. Um, and then I'll show one more piece that just give you an idea of some of the diversity of it, or, you know, this is a relatively sparse show, but this one is called Self. And then you can see that the color spectrum is the other way and a single kind of black portal. And it sounds like this.
So, um, so basically, what I'm trying to create here essentially is an instance of um, kind of synesthesia. And actually, there's this, I learned a specific term for it. It's called chromesthesia, which is basically the association of color and sound or color and music in, in, the, in the brain uh, as a kind of sensory perception um, or a kind of sensory mismatch. And so the idea was like to create this union of these two kind of freedoms of the color freedom and the sound freedom and what they would do together. Um, so it's really an experiment. Um, you know, everything came out exactly as I hoped or better, but I don't really know what it means. Um, and maybe I will learn, but you can see this range way, maybe this kind of exploration of this 1864 drawing, my crazy response to it, and then this result. And they're all kind of separate things in a way. Um, and yet this kind of knowledge or this <laughs> not 100% right knowledge um, is what determined all of the aspects of this work. Um, so it's it's a it's a question I have like where what is the knowledge in the work or is the knowledge just a tool to make the work, and what does that do? What does it do for my own creativity? What does it do for something that somebody might experience? So then um, I move on to one more musical work um, and that where it comes from. This is a picture of um, Milford Graves, both on the right and the left. And um, the, on the left, he is um, playing percussion instruments. On the right, he is reading EKGs. Um, he was a, a, when he was young, he, to put him in context, Milford Graves uh, died in 2021. And he was, I think, considered by many the greatest percussionist, living percussionist in the world at the time. Um, his reputation was that he was the only percussionist who could play two rhythms at the same time. And um, having been in the room when he's done something like that, it's very spooky. And uh, even if you don't know anything about music, you're um, shaken. Um, and at the same time, when he was young, and to also put in perspective, he played at John Coltrane's funeral. So that kind of gives you a kind of sense of his place in the world of music and jazz. And um, at the same time, he made a living for a little while as a medical technician. And this led him on a 40-year research project, collaborating with scientists across the globe and then making his own kind of medical uh, and software laboratory in the basement of his house in Queens, New York. He taught for 40 years at Bennington um, in the what I think was originally the Black Studies Department, uh, but had many musical apprentices there. And, um, and he did this research that I find incredibly compelling, basically a polyrhythm which is two, essentially two beats against each other. So three against four um, at the same time or mixed together. Um, it's not typically what we think of as uh, classic European style music. And in fact, it's mo much more prevalent in the global South, especially in various nations in Africa. And he it's but it's basically the, uh, the kind of the way you make um, music move instead of like it being a series of tones, it becomes a kind of motion. Um, and, or that's maybe just one way of describing it. Um, he believed that actually that the polyrhythm traditions came from listening to the human heart. And basically because the human heart does not actually beat like a metronome, it beats bum, 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 bum. And especially when consideration of movement so when I raise my arm, my heartbeat must change or I will die because basically the, pump, pump, the heart needs to pump a little bit harder and faster to get the blood up to my hand. So the heart is in constant motion. So he made a system to research uh, this, a software system to break down the speed of the heart and basically to divide up the rhythms that were contained in it through as, as the... Um, both as the heart beats and as the blood moves through the four chambers. And so typically if you went to his lab, he, he would record your heart. And, and then if he heard abnormalities, he would send you to the hospital. I think he saved a number of people's lives that way. Um, but then he also used that research to generate music. And I, I was just blown away by this. I was just like, here's this, here's this person who's, um, who does not, he had training as a medical technician, but he had no uh, science training. And he became a kind of science um, scientist um, through this kind of intuition that he had and then this incredible 
uh, dedicated follow through. He also was a visual artist and, and made his house into a kind of giant installation. And then he painted his drum set, which I loved. And um, this is his drum set on display uh, 2022 in New York. And above it is a piece called Earth Resonance. Um, and it's a gong that has a red cord attached to it. And when he made it in 2020, just a little bit before he died, it's a gong that he had painted a long time ago. And he um, uh, then attached, you know, essentially a magnet to it and basically created a, a set of rhythms of playing cymbals that would play through this gong. And I always saw the red line as the red cord as as blood, as as coming from the human heart and then vibration, vibrating. Um, he was also very involved in actually um, with a group of Italian scientists um, on the idea of specific vibrations being able to heal um, cells at, at the cellular level. So a small needle in, put into a single cell and then vibrate it at a certain um, frequency to create uh, cellular healing. So his research had an incredibly wide breadth to it. So I wanted to make something in homage and something that in some sense stayed true to what I believe is a, a fantastic and wonderful and very important theory of music, but of motion and of the body and of, yeah, reality. So this piece is called Heartline. And so I made a drum uh, covered in colored mirrors and uh, from the 40s uh, that filter specific um, wavelengths of light. And then on the top, I made this drum head. Oh, it had these touch spots, which were used. He had them on his drums, which were he would uh, alter the tone of the drum by having these touch spots, usually with his elbow as he played with his hand. It was quite amazing to watch. And then uh, from there comes a red cord and it goes up to the wall and through a series of clear tubes, like an artery, the blood line goes all the way uh, around the gallery. And if it was installed somewhere else, in theory, it could be installed at, you know, thousand feet away and comes to a, um, a kind of uh, console that I built uh, using something called the People's Synthesizer from 1972 um, with these colorful chords. And together with David Grubbs, it, we created a thing that generates a polyrhythm that never repeats. And basically it's constantly changing naturally through the natural fluctuations in just the way electricity goes in a wave that is not perfectly um, consistent at all times. So I'll play you a little bit what this sounds like. Oops. Yeah. So again, sorry about the ad, <laughs> um, uh, but they do have a great record label. Uh, uh, if in case you want to buy some amazing music, including Milford's. Um, so that's sort of the end of that series of works and basically trying to take various kinds of musical knowledge, inspirations from mus musicians, political claims and, or not claims, uh, statements of fact and, um, and this crazy idea of uh, a new idea of the color spectrum, combining all of those things into artwork. Then now I get even crazier in some sense because I started to make some big claims myself. Um, and uh, I got the idea that we live, I, I, I kind of feel like we live in desperate times. Like basically everybody's talking about the end of the world. Uh, people feel uh, distrust of, of institutions 
um, governments that are not supporting them enough. Uh, basically, we feel um, uh, stuck um, and afraid in some level. Uh, and so I felt it was really important not to make anything cynical. And it was really important to try to make something hopeful in this moment. And, you know, being just one person and having a limited imagination, I uh, came up out of desperation with this crazy idea um, that a geometric shape could be a tool for uh, bringing us into a new future, or in this case, totally reorganizing human society. This is a shape called a triaxial ellipsoid. It's a mathematical concept. Um, it does not really exist in nature, not perfectly like this. And there are things that are like it. And one of the things that's most like it is the human ovary, uh, which is a kind of, I feel like is a delicious fact that that's, um, the, the ovary is such a special shape. Um, there's also large galaxies that are close to this shape. And basically, uh, without going on and on about it too long, it basically, in my crackpot theory, and in somewhat in reality, if you look, contemplate this shape and you were to examine it and try to understand it, it consists of an infinite number of double center points. So there's no single center. Well, this, well, that show, seems to show it has a center. That's not actually its center. I mean, it is center in the sense of it's um, literally like halfway between the end and halfway between the side. But basically, the shape is generated by two focal points that are not at the center. And basically, they're interrelated. They can't exist without the other. And so this special shape, um, I began to imagine as uh, the first of a series of things which I would claim that geometry could be, let's say, our salvation. And um, basically, because if you contemplate this, you might imagine a way to reorganize society. So imagine if instead of a, um, a world can be based of circles where every person's individual and the world revolves around them, even if we overlap our circles in community and in solidarity, we're still, we still are each at our own center point. What if we organize society in which basically every decision was made in connection to um, another another person uh, and that basically all not in a duality but in like tied together like one to one so obviously uh, we don't live in that world although some people say we might um, that and we just don't want to admit it um, that we have such an effect on all of each other that this is actually how it works so I made a painting um, it's a kind of strange painting with an object uh, hanging off of it and with this very odd shape and um, it's a kind of, this one is kind of blue-black painting. And um, and then this is this shape. And even if you don't know anything about any of these ideas, if you look at this shape, it's really confounding. It's really, really mysterious. You can't quite figure out what kind of shape it is. It seems extremely specific and unlike something that you normally encounter. And because it's glass, it has very weird optical properties. And so uh, it's called the double centered world, the piece, but originally it was supposed to be called the only tool you need to completely reorganize human society. So uh, but, um, some people convinced me that might be almost too over the top. So this was a kind of hopeful gesture, I thought, and like, okay, what if a shape could just teach you how to, to change things? And then in a corollary, I became interested in this geometric shape um, so this is one of the most famous objects of uh, uh, artworks of all uh, Western art history. It's called Melancholia I by Durer from 1531 um, or 1513, I, one of the two. Um, and it's, um, it's the picture of the angel of melancholy, and uh, she's surrounded by symbols of, of that emotion. And then this strange object on the left that seems to be stone, uh, seems to be a geometric polyhedra shape. And there are hundreds of papers written about the mystery of this shape. It's extremely uh, confusing shape. We don't really know if it could exist, um, if it's real, um, where it came from. And I came to associate it with the idea that it is the central motif of the work. And I started to think that um, in a way that melancholy is the most important human, human emotion, not love. Because you could love people and they could love you back. You could love together. 
but you might never look around and see that the world is also full of tensions, irresolvable um, conundrums, and suffering. Um, and that, in fact, you might never have empathy because basically you wouldn't understand that other people suffer, that other people can um, have um, something that would require empathy. So the, I, you know, the idea that animals eat each other um, it's not a happy fact, right? It's just an, an undeniable fact. And um, it's a, a law of nature. Uh, it's, but it's very, it's an irresolvable question. So it's like, I associate that with uh, melancholy. And melancholy, if you can, can contain melancholy in yourself and still go on, this is an incredible act of uh, hope and courage. So this is a, a brown-black painting with melan melancholy, the emotion, contained in an object so you can safely f look at it without it overwhelming you. Um, and it's uh, one difference between it and Durr is that it has a kind of interior set of rooms that cr are created by the strange reflections that glass creates. So it kind of has a kind of interior and a very super complex one in which you see yourself. Um, so I thought that was a kind of also further extended the metaphor of, of melancholy, looking inside the, the shape of melancholy. Then I wanted to try uh, and also propose that that basically um, that you could look forward to a future that was different than our own in some very simple way. And so returning to this, perhaps equally famous as Durer's Melancholia is this, Black Square, Kazimir Malevich, 1915. And he claimed that this image and the associated images he made, uh, this is a kind of the painting on the left and the analysis of its geometry on the right, um, he claimed that these simple geometric shapes as paintings were the key to representing and leading us to a new spiritual and political reality. So, okay, great. And to, to put this in perspective, he makes these paintings beginning in 1915, I think around to 1917, 18, and then basically is threatened with murder unless he stops. So he does stop. And these paintings are so disturbing that he he's not allowed to continue. And he then paints like farmers in a field, peasants in a field, but he does use geometric shapes to do so. Um, but that just gives you a kind of sense of the gravity of these images at that time. And then that kind of set the tone for me of like, okay, a painting that of just a simple, an, ab an abstract shaped painting, a geometrically shaped painting could, uh, or a painting of a geometric shape could, could have meaning, so much meaning. And I also learned about um, a school of geometry called projective geometry, and this is perhaps the, one of the simple, simplest expressions of it, a cube inside the cube. Many people re, may recognize it, that this is the, a tesseract. It's kind of become, it's been famous for over 150 years, but um, it's also ha achieved a lot of fame recently in popular movies. And basically, it's an image of the fourth dimension. It's an image of the future. It's an image of time. It's an image of endless dimensional realities. And at the time of its discovery or invention or clarification or description or however you want to describe it, in the 19th century, it uh, it blew the socks off many people, whether they were um, spiritualists, scientists, um, architects, uh, many people were captivated by this. So I tried to make a set of, um, of paintings that did something similar. So drawing a simple geometric shape and projecting it into the future and basically the hope that seeing through and beyond that there, there is kind of like not this this black um, void or or field to look into but something where you look through and beyond and so each one is made out of a, a kind of faceted piece of glass that is seamlessly um, embedded in the painting with the surface and basically creates a set of lines that are geometrically coherent with the shape being projected into the fourth dimension as best I could. Um, this is another one. And um, they had a strange quality that, so like the, the, the let's say the, um, the plane or the, the kind of almost triangular shape on the upper right part of it, uh, in real life appears to be about six inches deep, but in reality, it's about three quarters of an inch deep. So it creates this illusion and of, of space, form, and extension. And as well, it kind of glows in the dark. It has a mirror behind it. And um, because of that and certain optical properties, it seems to glow without any electric lighting. 
So at the very least, I hoped that people would find these um, images to be uh, uh, hopeful in the sense of like seeing through and beyond and, and specifically this idea that we could create a new future simply using straight lines. And my next idea was following these things. These are uh, these are from a library of polyhedra. Polyhedra are, are mathematical forms, um, and they've been of interest to artists for since time immemorial, especially in the Renaissance. And people created kind of, like, as I said, libraries of them to both study, to inspire, to instruct. This is uh, a polyhedra that was depicted in a 16th century painting on the left as if it's filled with water, um, and it's hanging on a string. Um, and it's on the right is a... Uh, much more recently explored, very odd, much more, much more unusual shape called an sociohedron. So I decided to make these um, these pieces, which are called there's three of them called um, from the Library of Future Geometries. So basically, it was a kind of painting box, and then inside it were these um, suspended up above on these cones these strange and unusual shapes. And the idea that they could inspire one to think about the kind of uh, open-ended nature of knowledge and that basically that that these in these forms that can't really truly exist, uh, they're, they're mathematical concepts, um, but you can make an approximation, which I've done, and then which is also unusual compared to the paper models because you can again see inside it and see space um, traveling around in it. Um, so it was again just to try to uh, create a work that would could be contemplated uh, about the kind of magical nature of knowledge and where it could go and where does it come from. This gives you an idea of the scale of them, and each of them are unique. There are uh, hundreds of them, but not in. I guess from learning today that there could, in theory, be an infinite number of them, but people have only have to have the interest to construct or decipher in some sense out of um, a method of um, slicing up reality or matter uh, to create these forms. So they have to, you have to work quite hard to um, discover them, to, to form them. And then, and then I went back to this person, and I'll return, uh, I'll return to him later a little bit. Um, this is a man named um, uh, Claude Fayette Bragdon. He is uh, uh, a kind of known as a, the proto-psychedelic architect, um, and he also did these democracy projects, which I'll describe it in a few moments. And he drew this image of a landscape of geometry. But for him, the only geometries that mattered were these perfectly symmetrical ones, and that would seem to embody to him spiritual, um, spiritual, spiritual purity. Um, and I wanted, I thought I wanted something more, more weird than that. So I made this piece, which is called prismatic refractive geometry. It's an architectural installation. It's a kind of diorama, a kind of cinema that you look inside, and there are uh, uh, an endless number of reflections in very many different views. There's about 30 different views you can see by moving across it because of all of these angles of the mirror inside. And each one of them, you see this kind of endless expansion of these prismatic forms. And these prisms are um, made to be as strange as possible and, is, and as individual as possible. So to kind of create a landscape made out of like utterly unique kind of, but mathematically correct uh, mathematically coherent forms, and could this vision of a world of geometry um, be hopeful, or maybe uh, could also be uh, terrifying, maybe, in its kind of fractured nature. Um, I'm not really sure how, whether, which, which that is. Um, then I'm, then going back, I, a uh, couple of years ago, did an exhibition um, about uh, this famous story by um, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, who's coming in and out of my life since I was a little kid, a fairly young kid. And um, this famous story, which is quite short, describes um, the world as an endless library. And in this library that's infinite, that fills the whole universe, there are an endless number of rooms with every book that could possibly be written in the library. And it has, these are different theoretical 
following his description, these are different uh, realizations of what it might look like. He uh, initially made a mistake and had to republish the book because he described a mistake in how the library would be constructed. But I think he left a second mistake, and it's that's why there's this one is totally different than it seems follows the same description, but it's totally different. So it's it's an idea that actually comes from science originally in one level. It comes from an astronomy book from 1872, um, written by uh, the greatest military socialist military leader of the 19th century, and I, which I published the first English translation of, and it comes directly from that. But at the same time, it's a kind of literary, almost sci-fi idea. And I got the idea, well, th that in its infinitude, could I create a kind of an image of different kinds of knowledge? What about knowledge that wasn't contained in books? So this is a piece called Double, uh, from the Library of Doubles. And so this is an idea of a, a library of knowledge contained in jars, which is how we found many scrolls contained in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example. And I thought that like that um, these containers of knowledge could be doubled and infinitely repeated. And this could be this image of the endlessness of knowledge. Um, and that was sort of the metaphor that I've tried to create, make, made uh, two of these, and I'm making one more right now. And um, you can kind of see these uh, containers that reflect each other and uh, kind of then are even further repeated. They have these uh, kind of refractive um, things that close them. And then this was another library called from the Library of Atmospheres. And I imagine like, what if you had a library that was full of containers that contained gases, air, pressures? And so this was these objects had these kind of little things that looked sort of like a measuring thing at the top, like a thermometer, and these kind of bulbular forms. Imagine they're containing the knowledge contained in pressures and air and gases. So and this is an idea of knowledge as kind of a kind of metaphoric idea or, or uh, something that's not, it's very um, imaginative. This is the opening of a book that I published uh, about a, a, theory, uh, a writer named Paul Shearbart, who died in 1915 and has been an obsession of mine for um, the past 20 years. And one of the things that he theorized was a world that made of color. So unfortunately, I think for the world, that much of the world as it looks today, whether here or in China, um, uh, is mostly black and white. And basically, uh, and that's really due to a group of men in um, the in Germany and Austria in the teens, twenties, thirties, and, and then forties when they moved to the United States. Um, this is an image of a building, a colorful building that I've hand colored. Um, there's no extant color photograph of it, but it was very colorful like this. And I have been trying to make. Um, versions of this idea um, come to life again. So this is a piece called Tempietto, and it's, so it's a little temple um, based loosely based on the idea of Bramante's famous Tempietto in Rome inside the courtyard, a miniature building inside the courtyard of a nunnery in Rome, and then on the ideas of Sherbart and his friends who created actually um, designs quite similar to this, in which these are all made out of multiple multicolored tiles that pass through multicolored light into a space um, and are not transparent so that you can hide behind them. You know, you're not expo just exposed part of the surveillance state. So this has been a rediscovery of technology that has, uh, still exists, the same press glass technology that, that, um, that was in the building by Sherbart and Tout. And then I um, tried to think about as well, um, based on Claude Bragdon's idea of gathering people together and creating something democratic. I've been interested in the idea of, uh, of creating sculpture that creates the opportunity for other people, um, often coming w actually with funding. So basically part of the artwork has been um, to generate uh, money from the art world and pass it on to the music world, the dance world, and the poetry world. And so this is called Moon Mirror, and it's a kind of sound mirror. It reflects sound. It's a shape made out of these uh, prismatic tiles that, uh, that like, refract light, expand light. 
And then this is the greatest moment of my life as an artist. This is the Sun Ra Orchestra playing in front of the some the moon mirror and that's me on the lower left and um that's jupiter blue singing and marshall allen who was uh 97 no 94 then he's now 99 and i just saw him play he's amazing um and um this the orchestra was uh here is here to um save humanity and i believe it um and my partner said to me when uh she's a she's a, a half the glass is half full kind of person, but she's sitting next to me during the second set. She said, Shia, it's all down from, downhill from here. And I'm afraid she's right. This is the last project or second to last project I'm going to talk about. And um, this actually does has nothing to do with this kind of notion of knowledge or imaginary knowledge or research or reframe knowledge. Um, this was just something that I did um, uh, as part of a way of making art about motion, about the body, about movement. And um, it was recently performed at the um, National Gallery of Art. Um, so it's come to my mind again. It's called Walking Mirror 1 and Walking Mirror 2. And they're kind of funny. Um, it's these dancers carry these mirrors around and walk around reflecting everything around them. But they're kind of, they can't see. So there's a drawing on the floor that I made that's this kind of safety guide and also kind of an abstraction. And um, it's a very kind of strange and I think humorous um, thing of sculpture suddenly taking motion. And um, so I just thought that it was interesting to show this as a kind of um, also taking some ideas and, and in a very simple way, just trying to explore the nature of art in terms of uh, animation and human presence. And then the last thing I'll talk about is an older project, um, which is, um, I finished in 2008, but in a way it's sort of an unfinished project. Each time it's shown, it's a kind of collaboration with scientists uh, to talk about it and talk about its structure, its meaning, and its sources. Um, and it's called Island Universe, and um, it's going to be shown again uh, at LACMA this fall as part of the art and science um, uh, series that's sponsored by the Getty which I'm excited about uh, to be part of. And it's all based on the work of a Russian scientist from, and a paper he wrote in 1982, uh, which implied that the only way to mathematically account for the origin of the universe is to imply that there's many, many other universes. And I really kind of um, was attracted to this idea, especially based on this drawing here. So in the drawing on the lower left, it shows two universes. He talked about a, a sea of universes that are bubbling up, like like boiling water almost, um, and forming each forming their own unique universes. And, and you see a little boy and a little girl, and it shows that the universe is each each of their universes is expanding, but they're moving away from each other. And um, uh, the soccer ball is there to show that when I met the scientist in 2019 at Stanford, Andre Linda, he's, I told him the reason why I made this project was because I thought it had political implications. So the idea that if we assume there are other realities that are as rich and complex as ours, but potentially different, that might cause us to behave differently and, and than if we don't assume that. If we assume that we are in a world where we understand it and we have contained all, uh, absorbed all of its ideas, as opposed to the idea that there might be many more kinds of worlds, many wor kinds of knowledge, many other realities. So um, he, the soccer ball was there because um, he used it to show me what he thought. And to my great surprise, he said, um, yes, I never would have come up with the idea of the multiverse, uh, again, which in that time was, um, in 2008, was a kind of relatively fringe thing. It's now much more widely distributed distributed, and now there's all kinds of like, just like the Tesseract all kinds of pop popular movies about it um, yeah. uh, but he said he never would have come up with the idea if he hadn't been separated from the rest of the world and he said like like in the hexagon of a soccer ball um, by the Iron Curtain and that basically being not being really fully able to understand or have access to the other worlds in the across the globe and then he also said he did agree that it could have social implications I was very surprised because many scientists thought that this is a kind of strange idea. And actually um, here I've learned from my new friend, Andy, that in some ways it's also 
a complicated idea to say that we want to look for um, hope in nature. Um, and because the danger is, and he's right, that you then form nature how you'd like it to be. You, you find a justification in nature for how you want to act. I had had the maybe more naive idea that basically, actually, that we could change um, be, in relationship to nature and it would be a positive change. But um, i.e. That, that assuming that there are other realities might essentially make us more understanding of the differences and uniquenesses between us. Um, this is the actual piece. It in, involved these complicated um, visualizations of the expansion uh, of these different uni five different universes, uh, each based on a massive amount of research uh, that's been done on our own universe and all following this data very, very closely. But it's also just a kind of uh, very complex series of um, uniquenesses, like all of these rods end in clusters of um, of, of uh, bulbs and, and disks, balls and disks that indicate the kind of way that groupings of galaxies form within a universe. Um, and it's far beyond any one person's imagination. It's essentially is based on the study of nature. And it shows it's the wonderful fact that I do think I, I think is safe to stand by, which is that uh, and not um, be misused, which is that the u universe, while it's in general egalitarian in nature, i.e. everything is in general the same, it's full of individuality um, everywhere and equally so. So thank you very much. So I'm happy for comments, questions. Um, uh, we maybe don't have time for long speeches, but whatever you guys want to to say or not say um, or discuss. We have time now for some questions for the artist to speak. Just raise your hand. I'll bring you this microphone. Uh, thank you for the generous talk. Um, I've been curious from hearing about your work over the past couple days, um, how you think about function in your art, um, like the function of glass. I know some of your work is in response to that, but I'm just curious to hear more about how you respond to like associations of glass as like a functional medium. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh... You know, I, 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 to be totally honest, I, and maybe it's a disappointing answer, I, I don't really think about that question that much. I, I think about the function of art all the time. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I, I definitely thought about the functionality of glass in terms of um, these libraries of knowledge, like, so you'd be say different ways, like the idea of a, making something that might be imagined as a container of gas or imagined of contained a scroll full of knowledge as opposed to a book. Um, so I, I thought about it then, and then I have thought about it um, in 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 different ways um, in the past. Um, like like I've thought a lot about the history of the depiction of glass in paintings and what it means in paintings, like why it's depicted so often in paintings, um, and and usually it's in religious connotation. So it's you know in, in many many Last Supper paintings. So um, that it really interested me, and it's it's notion of its its non existence, basically it's kind of their not thereness um, seemed why why they used glass as a kind of metaphoric um, image. I do think um, a lot about factories, uh, like basically my the knowledge that I use to create most of my work comes from uh, the history of people creativity within factories and so often making things that are u usable for everyday life and but also at the same time expressions of kind of utopian hopes for what society could be so form can have a lot of meaning um potentially or i guess that i believe that 
things, many things are meaningful that don't seem at first glance to be meaningful. So I have, so in that sense, I, I have thought about the idea of function, if that answers the question at all. I guess what more obsesses me is what is the function of art? What is the function of looking? What is the function of being together um, in, in a space? Um, those kinds of questions are what I really focus on. Um, I think that, you know, the whole question of, uh, you know, function is, is complicated because uh, I'm not sure that I want to live inside an artwork, um, meaning like, I, like art is great, but maybe not 24 hours a day. So basically you also need things that you can use and that, that give you sustenance and, and um, help in getting through the day. So yeah, I guess, uh, but, and, but art to me is something that um, is a function of expanding, at least I hope, thought and under, and and compassion and um and possibility um and i i guess i believe in the endless functionality of art so this question is a little what uh, i tagged onto that one it has to do with materials because so much of your work seems to be um, embracing a kind of um, engagement with eternity or universal things or um, uh, and that piece about the um, library made of glass it sort of suggests that this could exist forever mm -hmm. holding like um, my breath and the breath of Jesus and the breath, you know, you know that the imagination allows you to imagine that this could go on forever. But um, the association that I often have with glass is of its fragility, of, of, of the possibility of the temporariness. And so, you know, you're kind of building really spectacular imaginative arguments out of something that could break and so I'm wondering if that's a thing that you think about or how that comes into play with your ideas uh, I feel it's funny two questions that I feel like uh, I don't have good answers for I never ever think about that um, basically and I kind of never want to um, uh, basically uh, glass is something that I work with because for two reasons one is I know something about it and so you know, I don't, there's a lot of other things I don't know anything about. And then the other thing that, so it's very practical in that way um, for me. And then I'm very, uh, uh, as well, I think that it's a, it is a metaphor for seeing through and beyond. And I like that, that idea. Uh, and I think the critic Dave Hickey said at one point, he said, like, if we didn't have glass, we'd have to invent uh, something um, that, that is like glass because we need it for language. So that glass is kind of actually a concept, a linguistic concept more than anything. And um, I agree with that. Um, it's a it's it's an amorphous solid. It's 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 a very it's kind of a unique state of matter. It's a it is kind of there and not there in some way. Um, and it's also actually very strong. Um, just as a kind of like defensive glass. And that's, that's like, if you, in theory, if you can, you could take a sheet of glass and if you could hold it perfectly straight up and down, you could build a skyscraper on top of it. It has kind of endless compressibility. It's just if the, 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 the sheet of glass tipped in, in, uh, in any way uh, or bent in any way, it would turn into dust or gas right away with a skyscraper on top of it. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think uh, just in all honesty, it's like uh, it's a blind spot of mine. Like I, I like I, I'm I'm an artist full of blind spots. I mean, I think all artists have blind spots. Maybe I have more. I don't know. But like, I don't know that. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, so I don't know anything about the breakability of glass um, or the, its na nature of fragility. Um, maybe if I were in a, in a psychoanalysis. Maybe they would say something different about my use of glass. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is like, there's a lot of great artworks about about glass breaking, uh, or not a lot, but like there's some great ones by Smithson or um, his first one comes to mind. Um, so I, I think that other artists have uh, 
figure that out. And maybe I'm just not destined to. Thank you. Um, I was wondering with your uh, intimacy with light and optics, if you were ever interested in recording or capturing or registering that light, um, it seems like most of your work is created to, um, to make in-person live moments for the viewer. But I'm wondering, given how deep you're into this relationship between light and optics, if it ever interests you to think of how that might be registered as an image. <laughs> It's like three for three. Um, <laughs> basically, so so essentially, I've been discussing the idea that um, that in our current moment, all art is photography. So basically, essentially, that for the most part, way art is tr um, transmitted transmitted as a concept now is through photographs of it, and basically, these photographs are often small. Um, and basically, it's no longer an image of, of an artwork. It's it's like or um, a reproduction of an artwork. It's kind of for many people stands in as the artwork. You know, I've actually been shocked to learn. I I thought of doing this, but I've never actually done it. Which is say to somebody, a friend, I went to your show, but I just went on the website. Really, do you know what I mean? But apparently, that's a thing. Like people actually do that. Like they go on the website. They oh yeah, and then they tell the artist. So yeah, I saw your show. Um, I'm unfortunately none of my work looks good in photographs. Really, um, it doesn't. You're right. I create things for um, human experience. And it's so foolish of me right now. Like it doesn't, like it's doesn't, I'm like swimming against the tide here. And, but I do believe one thing that I think that I stand for and that, um, that is, uh, I think really I speak about often because I think it is actually important. The whole world, all of the corporate world, all governmental bodies right now are trying to convince us that that the world is not material and that basically the, and even the idea of dematerializing the body um like the really if you think about it truly sick idea of uploading human consciousness to a computer is like being entertained and um basically i think one purpose that art can do in society right now is insist on the presence of the human body and basically and insist on the, our presence together um and I think that there are an endless set of messages saying the opposite, saying your presence is no longer required. And if you think about it like in the United States and, and across the globe, like we have really given all these corporations a gigantic gift instead of getting paid, paid family leave, uh, pregnancy leave, maternity leave, sick leave, um, et cetera. We we're like, oh, we'll, we'll just stay home. And basically, now you don't have to make a nice office for us. And also, like, um, we, but we don't get any support. And, you know, so, like, like worst of all worlds, right? Like, we have to pay the heating bill, electric bill. And we're not compensated for that. So, it, in a way, like, the world is full of, of, of recordings, measurements, metrics of things. So, yes, on a practical level, if I could, if I could uh, record my work in a better way, make fancy videos that really made it real for you or something. Yeah. On an ideational level, I think all, the idea of recording light and what, what many ways of thinking about the notion of registering light, what does that mean? Is that a photograph? Is that a shadow? Is that, um, you know, is that's an interesting idea for sure. Um, but anyway, I'm just using your question apologies to make this statement that, that, uh, and a self-serving one, because, my work is much better seen in person, um, that it's actually important to see things in person. And that, um, uh, you know, for myself, I love records, but uh, no record has ever moved me as much as a live performance. We have time for one more question for the artist. Hello, thank you. I was wondering if you could speak to both or maybe you pick one um an experience 
of beholding something that you've made that the things you're making are things that no one has ever seen before. Like no one has gotten to see those shapes rendered uh, at this resolution and in a transparent material. Like that's just something that like a human being probably hasn't beheld before. Um, and and you're, you are rendering out and making these experiences and inviting people into them. And you're motivated by this question around knowledge and, and somehow it's related to this question around direct experience. And I'm, I'm curious to, um, if you, if you would be willing or comfortable, like, could you speak to, um, like a time that you've been very moved by what your own work has done or the direct experience or what it has been able to kind of transmit to you like about how the world might be or how it might be in the future? Um, I, I think it's, I, I could try to answer that in a couple of different ways. I think, I think it's a difficult um, question to say that I, as the artist who makes something, can never be very clear on what it does. I mean, first of all, artists, you know, it's a strange fact that most artists get very little feedback. Like people are kind of almost afraid to tell you what they think a lot of times. And so a lot of times you don't, and also the artwork, if you have the incredible privilege of having your work in a public sphere and basically, and have hopefully having it move around at some level, like, it's like you don't have no idea what's happening with it. So basically you don't really, you know, it's 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 completely out of your control. And as well, like as as, as like <laughs> the sensitive beings we are, it's like also it's um I'm afraid of assessing too closely what I might do. Like meaning like, you know, it's easy for any artist who's not a total narcissist to have doubts that their work is doing anything at all. Do you know what I mean? Like, so basically it's, so in, in some sense, like assessing what, when my work, I, when I take away in part what you're saying is like, if I see my work succeed in a way, or basically like, um, or is it actually moved me maybe too, is a question too. But I guess I, I guess I think those are hard questions for me to answer in some ways, but I, but saying that I, I'm just trying to put forward some important things that I believe, like, like the idea that it's very common experience to be to, as an artist, whether it's you don't not getting to show your work enough, or whether or whether you have shows in ten museums to get to get feedback. So artists ends up being quite isolated in general about their own work. So it's it's interesting. Like I might, in that sense, I might be the worst person to speak about my work because I don't actually know um, what its what its effects are. Um, one thing I would though say was that I have been uh, confused and disappointed at some level at um, my inability to communicate. And I think it's it's difficult to communicate. And uh, it's very difficult, and especially if you're not saying something that's very obvious, you know. And so I am, I have, you know, a double threat of, of flaws as an artist in terms of the way the world works. I'm earnest, which is not good. And I am somewhat obscure which is also not good. Um, so I'm not, uh, so, so in some sense, I, and every time I predict what audience might get, get from my work, I'm wrong every single time. It's crazy. It's like, and often it's the, op they, everybody thinks the opposite of what I'm thinking. So I had one show where I got, I was like, this is what people are going to think. And uh, that was pretty close, but that's one time. Um, so I've kind of like in dealing with those questions, I have kind is one of the reasons why I have come up with this idea of, um, or this kind of maybe self-serving notion of the importance of the human body, or I, I don't, Actually, I don't mean any of that. I really do believe in the importance of the human body. Um, I don't care what anybody says, um, how great the internet is. Um, uh, but so I did have an experience in 2009 where I showed the Island Universe in Spain in one of, I didn't, for some reason, I didn't show images of that, but it's like probably my most successful exhibition in terms of like just magic. We installed it in this crystal palace in the, a Retiro Park next to the Prado. 
And basically the curator convinced me to do it. I was like, it's not going to work. It's going to be too small. It's going to look terrible. And she's like, trust me, I know what I'm doing. She was right. It looked amazing. It looked like it was um, meant to be there. Like it looks like it was built for the building. And the cool part about it was that that it's part of the the uh, National Contemporary Art Museum, but it's an offsite and it's free and it's in the middle of this beautiful park. So so hundreds and hundreds of people just saw this glittery thing in there and walked in. And basically, I don't speak any Spanish. So basically, I spent a lot of time there watching people and I realized that I could see people think. So basically, um, I realized like some people walked around and just like kind of walked around like, look, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, they walked out. Then other people looked and they're like looking at it and then moving around and then looking at it from another angle and then moving around. And then like, I was like, oh my God, I can see, they are thinking. They are looking and they are thinking. And basically I was like, I, I don't even need to know the language. They are, that's definitely the case. And I, now I've kind of made a study of that, like a, just a casual kind of observational study of that. And I really believe two things. One is that if you stand still, that um, you will think very different thoughts than if you move around. And basically, this is also the case when I went also to Madrid to see um, uh, in, Oma, in pilgrimage. I saved up my money at the, and went, spent three days alone at the Prado and to see Velazquez. And one of the amazing things about Velazquez's uh, Las Meninas is that basically it's very large. So basically, and it's shiny and it's hung slightly above your head. So basically, the, every image you've ever seen of arguably the most famous image of, of art in our now, like, or one of the, mo the most important image of art, um, you can't see there. The only way you could see it would be to build a giant scaffold and a giant light box and stand about 20 feet off the floor and we, inside this light, like, light box to prevent any glare. Um, and even then, it's so big, you, 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 you know, you, you'd struggle like to see if you're back far enough to see the whole thing, you can't see the details. So basically, like when you move around, you like make a little cinema, a little film in your head, like uh, from this part, that part, and this part from far away from back. And so basically, like art is like that. It is about this relationship to the human body, I believe. And now I've come to believe that that I all I I have given up on communicating. Like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that I can ever know, know what I'm communicating, but I haven't given up on the idea that, like, I could create work that might make people move around. And basically, if they move around, they might have different thoughts than if they're standing still. And basically, they're thinking in relationship to what's there. And then, so if people move around, I've, I, I won the jackpot. So... Thank you all for coming to tonight's lecture. Yeah, thank you very much for coming.